Hey, what's up, everybody? Rochio here, and um, 2020 was definitely a year. It yeah. had a lot of trials and a lot of tribulations. Not a great year for the world, but not too bad for video games. And with people being in quarantine and isolation, video games were there to cradle us like the lonely little babies we are. <laughs> <laughs> so that is... We, we do this annually, but we're doing 2020 a little different for our Game of the Year awards. We are throwing individual awards in there for every game. Such as, where I'm not going to say who has what, but say Best Character Design is one of the awards that could be awarded. Now these awards don't influence the slot placement. It's more or less just like a nifty call out for said game on this list. To make it feel a lot more like weighty in the entries for the 10 best games of 2020. Before I start with number 10, let me just say that Cyberpunk isn't going to make it. I played Cyberpunk on a PS4, and um, that is pretty much why it's not going to make it. It was... Yeah, I I tried to. It was... Uh, <laughs> it, it has good bones, but it's just not done on PS4 it, or Xbox or whatever. It was just mostly a good experience, but there were just bugs upon bugs upon bugs and crashing. I, w I crashed more than 20 times, I want to say, so that is why Cyberpunk's not making it. What is number 10 is probably a little shocking, is Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z Kakarot is legitimately a solid game. It's not... By game standards, it's not phenomenal, but by Dragon Ball game standards, single player wise, that's the best it's ever been, baby. It's an action RPG with some sweet boss fights, some sweet action. They even opened up the lore a little bit more with uh, certain things like explaining why there's random people that are bears walking around. It was some. <laughs> it was basically a fashion craze at some point to get your genes modified to look like an animal. What the hell? It is what the game said. So stuff like that and. Uh, generally fun combat it plays a lot like a more polished xenoverse but it feels more like dragon ball because they don't have to worry about character balancing and stuff so the bosses are just shooting gigantic lasers everywhere you're trying to dodge and it's appropriate how powerful you feel versus how powerful the boss feels every time like raditz felt like an overwhelming force at the time <laughs> so did nappa but when you're goku and you go fight nappa you are the overwhelming force and that's they scaled the combat in such a way where like, it's hard when it should be, and it's easy when it should be, almost. It's like, when Goku goes Super Saiyan, kicking the shit out of Frieza. Like, first, until Frieza goes 100%. So, there's a lot of reasons I really loved Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Those are just a few sweet bosses, sweet fighting mechanics, and that is why it got our most flashy combat award for 2020. One thing I absolutely love in video games is when the world is just immersive and sucks you in. And one of the best games for that is Shin Sakai Into the Depths. So we're giving that the Atmospheric Game Award. That game just is gorgeous. Like, you feel like you're underwater because the physics are wonky. You're just like this weird, wet astronaut dude in a submarine. <laughs> like... <laughs> I mean, that's that's simplifying it a little bit too much, but you're underwater, there's like ice that's dangerous, all the fish are dangerous, you can f trip and fall and hurt yourself, like there's... The, Smash Bros. It's, it's very dangerous under the water, and you're stuck there the whole game. You do find a drone that helps you find things, you get a submarine that helps you traverse, but it's always like up in the air, well, not air really, but... You're always just on your toes, ready to possibly die or kick some butt, either way. Because there is some combat. It's not the best, but it's not the worst either. It's exactly what you would expect for <laughs> underwater combat to yeah. be realistic. And sometimes it's big fish, sometimes it's robot fish, sometimes it's like mining equipment. There's all kinds of stuff in that game, and it was it's, it's a damn shame that barely anybody seems to have played it. In recent years, indie games have been on the rise, and it's always great to see them try stuff that's so ambitious, like the AAA titles don't really want to risk trying it, and it's great to see it work out, and it did just that in Monster Sanctuary. They kind of mixed 
uh, the RPG elements of Final Fantasy and Pokemon into one, and it worked beautifully. Monster Sanctuary is this great, like, pixel art RPG, and not only can you capture every monster, literally every monster in the game you can have, but every monster has, like, a weapon slot. I think three accessory slots and different abilities and then you get to even weirder stuff as you progress through the story because like the story's also story's not the best ever like it'll get you there but that's about it like it's nothing to really write home about but it, it goes along but about halfway through the game you get the ability to shift monsters so you can either shift them towards the dark or you can shift them towards the light and this gives every monster one a new outlook like which is really color scheme and then it gives him a new ability so like your frog going to the light side he now will buff every time he heals something and it's absolutely crazy <laughs> like these like game changing buffs you can get by phase shifting your monsters and then it it was one of the most fun games i did not care about the plot, which is weird to say in an RPG, especially yeah. <laughs> a turn-based RPG, but it also kind of has like an overworld Metroidvania aspect, because not only can you fight with these monsters, but you can have one behind you the whole time, and every monster has its own overworld ability, so whatever monster is following you, they can do something in the overworld, like a bird can lift you up. A dragon that's like evolved can lift you up even higher and you find these spots in the world where like you need to see in a dark room so you're just like okay let me get this bat because his overworld ability is so gnar so now I can see everything in this dark room and that's it's awesome. it's like a metroidvania type situation where like you walk in and you're like I don't know what to do here and then you get that ability and you're like I can go back there and do that thing Monster Sanctuary ends up bringing a lot to the table. It will please all the RPG fans with the equipment and skill trees. It will please all the Metroidvania fans with the vast, like, side-scrolling overworld that you have to revisit all the time with different abilities to get new sp stuff. And it will please just about anyone who likes pixel art because all of the monsters are, like, super detailed very cool looking in the pixel forms and have drawn forms in the monster encyclopedia and that is why this game wins best character design because yeah it's all monsters but they're the characters you can unlock them so you can have all this in your party with uh, like a hundred monsters or party members so it's best character design and that's bro trio fact <laughs> <laughs> Twenty twenty brought us a lot of great games, but it also brought us a new console generation. And one of them that had its own launch title was the PS5. And of course, we we're talking about Spider Man, Miles Morales. Yes, it's a PS4 game pretty much, but it had PS5 upgrade to have like the beautiful textures, 60 FPS, and trigger tension. And I loved swinging all around. I actually got kind of like my fingers got tired from it because <laughs> like you swing all the time yeah. and every time it's tension yeah but miles morales is a short but sweet adventure it's very very short like maybe six seven story missions yeah it's like three but, hours yeah. but it's three yeah, it good is. hours you, you like you catch like one pigeon instead yeah. of like 20 <laughs> They even have a lot of pigeon jokes to call back to the original Spider-Man on PS4 and many other callbacks to it as well. It really is a cool way that they explain why Peter Parker is not there and why Miles is on his own proving himself. Peter and, getting his face fixed. That's what's happening. God, it, <laughs> it threw me off any time I saw him. Like, There's one scene where Miles bumps into him in the past and I was like, who is this guy? I recognized Doc Ock before I recognized Peter. He was Anyways, younger than Miles. What the? Miles is a great, fun time. The swinging and combat is just like it was in the original Spider-Man. But now, you got Venom powers. And Zappy Pops, it's baby. It's really <laughs> awesome. Like, it makes it a little easy, 
but it's you feel so powerful like venom strike doing the camouflage you can do the venom like ground pound one i loved doing that one it's really cool really interesting and has a lot of great character moments in it as well but we loved Miles Morales here. It's Spider-Man, so obviously we loved it. We gotta give it best licensed game because it's freaking Spider-Man. Now there's two of them. For number six, we had to go with a game that was pretty much delightful from start to finish. It is getting our best art style award as well. We are talking about Paper Mario, the Origami King. Paper Mario, Origami King looks absolutely gorgeous. Everything yeah. looks like it was made out of paper and cardboard and paper mache. Not only that, though, the color palette is very vivid. Like you, it's got some deep reds and a lot of like green greens. I don't really know how to explain the color, but it's it's there. <laughs> the wa the paper the, water. It's a lot of contrast and pop to it. The paper water looks so cool when it's flowing, and it's weird that they have oddly realistic water in the forest section <laughs> for some reason. But the paper water, and it brings back trauma from the rafting minigame, but that water looks really cool when it's splashing against cardboard rocks and stuff. Yeah. It, that, that's why I said mostly the life from start to finish. Some of them minigames were rough. But Paper Mario was such a delight, so much better than the previous couple Paper Marios. It belongs with the Paper Mario, like, upper echelon. I really liked Origami King. If you haven't played it yet, you guys should give it a shot. If there was a game in 2020 that would make the people that don't think video games are art eat crow and realize it's true, it would definitely be The Last of Us Part 2. Last of Us Part 2, we are giving the award for best characterization because the characters are what makes The Last of Us. And they are on full force, full presentation in Last of Us 2. It is so pretty. Everybody looks so good. The mocap is so amazing. Like, you can see every muscle of Ellie's mouth moving whenever she is just in awe of, spoilers, Joel's dead. And it is one of the biggest emotional roller coasters, too, because, like I just mentioned, Joel is dead. And you start low. And then you get lower, and then lower it is the worst, like, <laughs> best way to feel about playing a game. And the fact that a video game can invoke so much hatred and sadness and pity and just aggression and almost all emotions other than happy. <laughs> it's one of those games where it's hard to sell it to people because you tell them, I really liked experiencing it but i hated it at the same time it's yeah like i don't it's it's like the movie schindler's list yes it is like yeah that's it's not a, a fun it's watch a, it's a good movie but it is not a fun watch and you feel terrible at the end yep. and like that's one of the few really good movies that i don't think i'm ever going to rewatch. what about all those internet people that didn't play it and have strong opinions of it though uh, I, I, I think they're fools because you should play it. Because The Last of Us 2, we're going to talk about the actual gameplay here now. Uh, it's got, like, super duper polished Last of Us 1 gameplay. Like, the stealth is the stealthiest it's ever been because the enemies are smarter. And they know, like, if you're in the grass and they're above you, they can tell you're in the grass. And they're like, hey, bitch is in the grass. Go get her. <laughs> And they're, they just seem a lot smarter. There's a lot of other aspects, too. Like, you can get arrows stuck in you because there's other archers. And if you have an arrow stuck in you, you got to pull it out fast because, one, it keeps, like, hurting you while it's in there. And, two, you can't listen mode while you have an arrow stuck in your arms. So you got to get it out to see who's coming up on you. It's not in your ears. <laughs> yeah, but it's throbbing. Last was Part 2 was very divisive for... Killing off Joel for some reason. Don't think that's divisive. It was really Avengers Endgame vibes when we were going into this. But it was mainly divisive because it takes you playing as Ellie. And then halfway through the game, you start to play as Abby, the villain of the game. And then you feel bad for the villain. It's really fun. If you want to hear me talk way more in depth, check out our powwow about it. I've talked about it for a while. And I've been talking a while here, so I'm going to wrap it up. But Last of Us had great characterization great graphics great gameplay and a really interesting story that really kept you going 
we're moving on from The Last of Us to a whole different kind of nightmare. We're talking about Bugs next. Speaking of that, that gets our award for Best Original Song, because you cannot deny that it got stuck in your head. You just can't. It's a very uh, catchy song. and It's, it's a, a great de- song. <laughs> it's a delightful game with strong Pokemon Snap vibes, but then it takes a massive turn, which I did not see coming. And uh, catching every li- one of these little creatures was a delight. Playing Bug Snacks was probably the most delightful time I had in all of 2020. It was constantly putting a smile on my face. Never felt like it was overstaying its welcome, really. There were a, a few spots where it was like knocking on the door of that with the palette swap Bug Snacks, but overall, yeah. I enjoyed Bug Snacks from start to finish. Too Granted, many it's pretty short. Way but... too many Strabbies. There's like Strabbies, White Strabbies, Raspies, all, a lot of them. They were yeah. the same. But overall, Bug Snacks was a delight from start to finish. The characters were super well done. The bugs mostly, over half of them at least, were unique <laughs> and had a unique way to catch them. And the tools you got and the friends you made along the way were the best part of Bug Snacks. It's not every game that fully seems to have 100% nailed what they were going for. But I believe Ghost of Tsushima did. And I believe if it was not cool, fun, or Japanese as hell, they did not put Ghost of Tsushima in. There are a lot of reasons we're about to talk about why we gave it the best new IP award. Ghost of Tsushima, in my opinion, was mostly phenomenal from start to finish. There are hiccups here and there. Some of the side quests are whatever. But I didn't care because I got to do this cool sword combat and, and stealth and horseback riding and Climbing all over the place, hunting yeah. down foxes and birds. Yeah, following the wind. I don't care that I have a hundred headbands by the end of this game, because I love headbands anyway. <laughs> there are so many headbands. Like, and all the too- side quests may not be like that enthralling, but you get either a headband or a charm from it, so yeah. you get something. And a lot of the side quests were very enthralling as well. Hmm. There are a lot of involved ones that take from the beginning to the end of the game to fully complete, because they just keep going. It's awesome. The sword combat is... Some of the best, especially as far as realistic sword combat goes. Yeah. I even like how it, they did hard mode. They didn't give the enemies more HP. They just made them harder to parry and stuff like right. that. Because it was like, it's a samurai game. That's how I'm playing <laughs> on hard mode right now. And it's very rewarding and detrimental. Because you're either really good at it and kill them like <laughs> instantly. Or you get hit once and you're going down. I <laughs> And it was gorgeous from start to finish too. I hope you like Leaves. Because they's a-coming down, <laughs> and that's about all you get in Ghost of Tsushima. <laughs> it's a lot of leaves, but it's gorgeous. The outfits are... The outfits having their own... Everyone has their own unique ability, and that yeah. is fantastic. They get cooler looking as you upgrade them. I really like that. And you get hats. A lot of hats. There's <laughs> a lot to do in Ghost of Tsushima, and you don't even have to do all of it to get the Platinum Trophy. That's one reason I love it a lot, too, but... Mostly everything in Ghost of Tsushima was fun. I really liked the characters. I really enjoyed the story. And it's another example of games being art. Just look at them leaves and tell me games aren't art. When it comes to video games, I am a huge fan of being proven wrong. And that is just what happened with Final Fantasy VII Remake. Because I went into this game with little to no to bad expectations because Final Fantasy 7 is basically perfect and they were making it episodic and I was like no you start at Midgar you end at the Northern Crater that's how it's meant to be and then Final Fantasy 7 remake came out I got it cuz it's Final Fantasy 7 I was like I'm just gonna play this and talk about how much I like the first one but <laughs> The minute I got into it, I was like, holy shit, this is incredible. And then next thing I know, it's three days later, and I've already beat it twice. And a lot of that reason why I immediately fell in love with it is because of the fluid and mixture hybrid action and RPG combat. They did it perfectly. We are giving Final Fantasy VII Remake the Bro Trio Award for Best Combat because it is perfect. It's turn-based for the turn-based parts like magic and stuff like that and it's action for the action-based parts like punching and chopping it's amazing every character feels great to play with and 
completely different from everyone else, which is what a balanced party should be. I just don't know how they kept the materia system mostly intact in an action RPG. It's incredible how they did it. Uh, now, Final Fantasy VII Remake is not perfect. There are a lot of cats in it, and you have to find all them cats. <laughs> but it also has Wedge in it, so it kind of balances out because he is now hilarious. And brings me to my next point. All these characters from, like, the first, what, like, three hours of the original game in Midgar are now fully expanded to full-fledged characters with voice acting. Yeah, Wedge is goofy, Biggs is boring, and Jesse Thirsty. Yeah. You, get character you also get to embellish more on like Tifa and Cloud's backstory and relationship, making it feel like they're leading towards something bigger and better in the coming games. Because I always felt that in the original, it was kind of like Tifa was runner up and got Cloud by default because Aerith, spoiler alert, died. And then Tifa was just <laughs> like, Yeah, we're best friends. Now I'm the love interest. But. Now they're making it feel more like a choice for Cloud. Like if you're going to choose Aerith or Tifa. And they're, they, with how they added in the new stuff, it seems like it could stray away from it. So, you know, it might be Tifa that dies. Like the rumor back in the day that you could swap out those two and keep Aerith in your party. But whether that happens, whether they even put in stuff that seemingly got cut, like the Revive Aerith quest line was in the future and we'll find out later whenever Final Fantasy Remake Part 2 comes out or whatever it's called and we can finally get to play as my boy Red 13. We said it earlier but 2020 was it was an odd year to say the least but in a way it was kind of a gamer's dream because if you were lucky enough to be quarantined I was not I, ha I was deemed essential, but uh, there's one game that came out at the absolute perfect time to become a smash hit, and that's Animal Crossing, so we're giving it the perfect timing award, yeah. because it came out right when everybody was getting locked down, everybody was like, oh, I have to stay inside now? There's a new Animal Crossing. I'm going to dive head first and do everything I can do. And when you can't everybody. socialize, you got a game simulating socialization. Oh yeah, it like you—you you had people on Instagram like check out my my crib that I made. Like it was—it was, it was a phenomenon. The fact that and, <laughs> I forget who did it, but some actual person was hosting a late night show in Animal Crossing and got actual <laughs> oh, celebrities yeah. playing oh, Animal yeah. Crossing. Yeah, go yeah, on, yeah, like, Phil like, Spencer. Of Xbox went on there on an Animal Crossing show Xbox playing man. Animal Crossing. His name is Gary Witta, by the way. He's a funny man on several podcasts I've listened to, and he wrote uh, was one of the writers on Star Wars Rogue One. Oh, oh, okay, cool. But, but yeah, like expanding on that, you had people doing weddings in Animal Crossing. You had people like just that they were using it as a chat room, yeah, concerts too, right? Yeah, yeah. concerts. You. Were, it was incredible. It was. Like, I, I have never seen. No, the course. world come together quite like that about well, a single game. Now, of course, you had your Fall Guys, you're Among Us, and those didn't make it to our list, unfortunately. Those had their time in the show. Oh, they sun definitely too, did. But nothing hit as hard as Animal Crossing and stayed hitting as hard as Animal oh, Crossing. Oh, people that don't even like life sim games were getting Animal Crossing. FOMO is powerful, man. They just didn't know. Oh, yeah. People were buying a Switch just to get access to Animal oh, Crossing because okay. they kept hearing mm -hmm. so much about it. But Animal Crossing New Horizons was a very, very fun time sink. It was really interesting to play. We're going to talk about the actual game here, not the yeah. phenomenon that happened. But the whole crafting mechanic worked so well in it. And the fact that you could just get recipes from doing good villager shit was awesome. It really... Oh, yeah kind of, like, enforced the good behavior to talk to your villagers all the time, which we... If you watched our hype trains and stuff for it, we said we wanted to be better at talking to all our <laughs> villagers, and we were. No other Animal Crossing has put, at least for me, has pushed me forward to want to do it as much. Like, because yeah. it felt yeah. like I was, even though you're not the mayor this time, it felt like it was all on me. Like, yeah, I was in yeah, charge, really I did. had to do everything, and I finished the museum for the first time ever. I've never done that before. 
I did a lot of things. I got super into flower breeding and bred oh, every yeah. <laughs> hybrid cross of every flower, and it took so long, and that is just one of the many reasons I put over 330 hours into this game. I'm, I'm a little, I dipped a little under him, I'm at 300. Yeah, and I, I only hit 195. He was actually working. Yeah, I was, so was, I was I. at work, and <laughs> by the time I finally got access to the landscaping, I didn't want to do it anymore. So I just left my island as it was, and just go in and catch bugs, catch some new fish, and that's Animal Crossing, baby. <laughs> so that's our list. Hope you all liked it. If there was a game on here that we didn't list, let us know in the comments. There was a, a good bit of good games in 2020, but these are the 10 Bro Trio picks for this year. So if you have a different list, let us know. We're going to add it to our backlog more than likely. But stay tuned to Bro Trio for top 10 2020 bosses coming out later. And we'll catch you all next time.